The C4 Corvette, it's the generation that some claim doesn't really get a lot of respect in 2024, but is this really true? And if so, is it deserved? Let's talk about it next. Toys for life. Now in the past, even I have done a couple of videos where I compare the C4 Corvette versus the C5 with the goal of determining whether or not the C5 is in fact a more capable performance car than the C4, and if so, by how much? And while the feedback from those videos has been overwhelmingly positive, there's definitely been some ruffled feathers. More recently, I published a video where I laid out with plenty of facts and supporting data, my top five choices for the best performance bang for the buck Corvette available of any generation in early 2024. And even though the various C4 Corvettes from 1984 to 1996 are plenty inexpensive, None of them made the list. The main reason I ruled out the C4 Corvette is because of its relatively flimsy chassis as compared to the C5, 6, and 7. And yes, as a result, more feathers were... I also leaned on the fact that most of us car guys eventually want to increase our Corvette's performance with things like headers, camshafts, new cylinder heads, and maybe even a turbo or two. The problem with this is all C4 Corvettes are OBD1, and in 2024, trying to find the appropriate tuning hardware, tuning software, or even a competent tuner who can work with OBD1 in your area is becoming extremely difficult. For those out there that might not be aware, all C5 Corvettes and newer run on various generations of OBD2 computers, and these can all be tuned Relatively speaking, much easier using tuning software such as HP Tuners or EFI Live, and finding a competent tuner in your local area is much, much easier than OBD1. Some guys out there even go as far as to tune their own vehicles by purchasing their own copy of HP Tuners or EFI Live. And then with the help of various internet resources like the Goat Rope Garage YouTube channel, the forums on HP Tuners, or classes that are authored by Calibrated Success, the Tuning School or Evans Performance Academy, they figure out how to use the software to properly tune their own vehicle. Anyways, let's get back to the three main questions that this video is trying to answer, which are, number one, are C4 Corvettes being disrespected or not? Number two, why might this be happening? And number three, also if so, is any of this disrespect deserved? So in my humble opinion, are there times where here on YouTube C4 Corvettes are being disrespected? I would say the answer is yes, not by me, but here are some specific examples of things that I think people, mainly C4 Corvette owners, probably find disrespectful. I think that custom C4 projects like this one can sometimes rub loyal C4 Corvette owners the wrong way. And that wasn't even a one-off because this guy seemed to be following a similar playbook when he came up with this C4 rendition. Now obviously beauty is in the eye of the beholder and after all this is America. If somebody buys a C4 Corvette with their hard earned money, even if it is a pristine specimen, they are 100% free to do whatever they would like to do with it, even if that entails damaging it, or worse yet, destroying it. Don't have any power, you know, they're just not great. All of these things might be viewed by some C4 Corvette owners as being disrespectful, and I get it. Even being a C5 owner, I see similar things, and it's just hard for me to understand why somebody would take a C5 that looks to be in pretty decent shape and do something so silly with it. However, one of my other cars happens to be an 11-second Pontiac Fiero, and people either tend to love this car or they hate it. And through the years, I've heard everything from when's that thing going to explode to that thing is a death trap and pretty much any other jab you can think of. And so maybe my skin has already thickened up a little bit, or perhaps that's where I drew the motivation to quadruple its horsepower. So my message to the C4 crowd is to just relax, let the skin thicken up a little bit, and if somebody's really being a jerk about C4 Corvettes, 
Just tune them out. Question number two is, why might these potentially disrespectful things be happening to the C4 Corvette generation more so than to other Corvette generations? And I think the answer has three components to it. First, they made 350,000 C4 Corvettes from 1984 to 1996, and that's a lot. And by contrast, they made 250,000 C5 Corvettes and just 215,000 C6 Corvettes. A lot of those 350,000 C4 Corvettes have been stored more than they've been driven for the last couple of decades, and each year a whole new crop of C4 Corvettes floods the used car market, where the demand for them is soft, especially since you can get a C5 Corvette, which generally speaking outperforms it in just about every category for not a whole lot more money and as a result c4 corvette prices always tend to be quite reasonable all of this means that there's just not much financial risk if a guy takes a perfectly fine c4 corvette and creates a wild custom that may or may not destroy the car's value. Additionally, some YouTubers are clearly buying C4 Corvettes now simply to destroy them for the purpose of the YouTube video. And in my opinion, that really is a shame, but right, wrong, or other, it's the right to do so. And if their channel is big enough, it probably makes financial sense as well. The third question we are trying to answer is, is any of this disrespect deserved? And to that I would say while the C4 Corvette was definitely a giant improvement over the C3, there's definitely a couple of things that Chevrolet engineers likely aren't proud of. The first item has to be the OptiSpark ignition system that just so happens to be super sensitive to moisture. And GM engineers decided to place it down low on the front of the engine, just underneath the water pump in a location that an average third grader could probably conclude is not a good place for it. Water pumps tend to fail on average roughly every five to 10 years, give or take. And when they fail, they leak coolant. And in this case, it leaks right on top of the OptiSpark ignition system, which means your C4 Corvette is no longer gonna run. And now you have to not only change a water pump, but also service your OptiSpark as well. If that wasn't bad enough, again, due to the fact that the OptiSpark is up front and down low on the engine, also meant when you hit that occasional puddle that turned out to be a lot deeper than you thought it was, it also meant you had instant regret for canceling your AAA towing membership. As a result, the OptiSpark ignition system became affectionately known as the OptiJunk ignition system mainly because of all the 92 to 96 Corvette owners it left stranded through the years, some of them more than once. The next disappointing C4 item that definitely could have been prevented has to be the well-documented chassis flex issue. The C4's chassis design started way back in 1979, and originally it included a T-top structural member that tied the A-pillar to the B-pillar, for strength and rigidity. Fast forward a couple years and now it's late 1981 or so and a higher up manager at Chevrolet made the suggestion that the T-top structural element be removed so that the cabin could have a completely open roof area for that 1% of the time that the owner decided he wanted to drive around without the roof. This was a pretty serious change to the chassis of a car that was supposed to launch in 1983 and it sent the chief engineer Dave McClellan and his team scrambling, trying to find ways to reinforce the rest of the chassis to make up that structural rigidity that the T-bar portion of the roof was supposed to provide. Modifications were made and the team did their best to reinforce the chassis, and that removable roof was now required to be bolted in place tightly as opposed to using latches like the C5 and C6 do. And it's believed by many that the bolt-in roof was required because the latches simply wouldn't be strong enough due to how flimsy the chassis was. And through the years of the C4 Corvettes driving around in the normal wear and tear, some of the chassis have become so loose that the roof panels can't handle the stress and they break. And don't just take my word for it. Here's what Lyle at CNS Corvettes has to say about the issue. That chassis flex has gotten to the point where uh, it was stressing the tops enough to where the acrylic, like especially the clear glass tops, acrylic tops, 
would start cracking, even brand new ones that were professionally installed. So at the end of the day, the C4 Corvette was still a major improvement over the C3, but sadly, it's just not as good as it could have been. So yes, in my opinion, these C4 shortcomings do need to be brought up and discussed once in a while, because every year there's a new crop of potential Corvette buyers that are out on a mission to buy their first Corvette. And if they're prudent, they're gonna wanna educate themselves and find out everything they can about the generations that they're considering for purchase so that ultimately they can make an informed decision. Now with all of that having been said, I personally do have an itch to buy a later year decent condition C4 Corvette, keep the exterior basically stock, but do some serious structural and mechanical modifications to get it up to around 850 horsepower or so and have some fun. And here are a couple of C4 videos that I personally find quite inspiring. So here's a uh, C4 1690 horsepower vet. Going to be tearing the streets up of Missouri soon. Just a, it's just an amazing thing to be able to have a motor that makes 18 inches of manifold vacuum and you know poop out 1,070 horsepower at 15 pounds and then 1,680 horsepower at 36 and with a lot more left 